With part two of our lecture on East Asia, we are going to focus on developments in Japan, uh, more or less concurrent with those that we considered in China. Uh, so we begin with what's known as the Warring States era, uh, roughly 1467 to 1600. And this is a period uh, during which uh, Japan had become politically fragmented, uh, so a period of internal wars, and to some extent very uh, very chaotic, uh, kind of a period of anarchy, uh, and then uh, eventually reuniting uh, during the Tokugawa era, uh, covering from 1600 to 1868. And so that's the period during which Japan became reunited and stability was achieved uh, into a certain degree, a very prosperous period for Japan. So that kind of breaks down uh, the period that we're about to examine. So starting with the Warring States period, uh, this kind of began with the collapse of a military dictator uh, dictatorship known in Japanese as a bakufu that had been uh, under the control of the Ashikaga family. And, uh, you know, even within the bakufu, regional lords were extremely powerful. The collapse of the bakufu uh, after uh, really beginning in 1467, removed the last barrier uh, to, uh, you know, kind of war between the regional lords, known as daimyos. And the, again, the daimyos very powerful, also very ambitious, so kind of the only thing keeping them in check up until that point had been the bakufu. And what you ended up with, uh, once it collapsed, were hundreds of small warring states daimyos, each with its own uh, small army or band of warriors. And so here we see kind of an artistic depic uh, depiction of what one of those armies might have looked like marching off to war. Uh, as you might imagine, right, with you know, hundreds of these small uh, states that emerged with the collapse of the Bakufu, uh, things became very chaotic. And in some ways, as far as, you know, from the perspective of regular uh, folk, would have been a period of anarchy. So pretty much the, uh, you know, within this kind of uh, anarchic, chaotic environment, uh, it was pretty much a kind of dog-eat-dog -dog mentality, or, or as they would put it, the strong eat and the weak become the meat. Uh, and so you're going to have, you know, a long period of hundreds of these daimyo, uh, daimyos fighting it out, but eventually uh, many of them are going to become consolidated into a smaller number of regional states, right, as uh, the more powerful uh, effectively consume the weaker ones, absorb their territories into their owns. So instead of hundreds of local states, you now have tens of regional states. And this is also going to create more stability, uh, at least within these regional states. Uh, kind of the fighting, in a sense, becomes more organized. Uh, and so this is also going to see some degree of economic recovery. We're going to start to see these towns begin to develop around the primary castles of regional states, merchants setting up shop around them. Uh, and, you know, there's still uh, obviously political division, but things are beginning to stabilize. Uh, and now you're going to see regional states forming alliances as they kind of fight it out to see who's going to emerge uh, in a position of power. And eventually a single lord remains, Oda uh, Nobunaga, uh, though we should be careful, we can't really say that Japan has become properly reunified at this point. Now, we should also note that a particular kind of social hierarchy is beginning to develop uh, in connection uh, with the kind of political situation, this kind of situation of political fragmentation, uh, sometimes referred to as Japanese feudalism because in some ways it resembles feudalism in Europe. We should be careful. The term feudalism was invented to describe developments in Europe. So whenever we kind of impose it on developments in another part of the world, uh, we have to be careful not to imagine uh, that it strictly resembles what was happening in Europe, uh, you know, maybe missing something that is actually quite distinct about, in this case, Japan, right? So kind of the equivalent of nobles in Europe would be the daimyos, but we start to see kind of a, a ranking emerging among them where you have some very powerful daimyos at the top who control large tracts of lands or, or fiefs. 
Uh, and then beneath them, lesser daimyos who end up becoming effectively vassals who owe their loyalty to the powerful daimyos and very often function as officers or commanders of their armies and who are awarded smaller fiefs of their own. Uh, and then regular folk beneath them. Uh, but as we're uh, going to speak of in a moment, uh, you are going to have the majority of Japanese being peasants, but we should know, first of all, that you have a sizable merchant class right from the start. Second of all, there isn't going to be this kind of clear distinction between those who do the fighting and those who produce food, because very often peasants are going to be uh, fighters as well. And we'll be looking at that momentarily. One last thing we should know, uh, note is the practice of unigeniture. Uh, which basically means that inheritance uh, goes from the father to one son, right? So that rather than uh, the fief being divided up between a number of sons, all of it would go to whoever was considered to be the most able son, maintaining the integrity of the, uh, of the estate, if you will, right? And this becomes a universal practice uh, among all daimyos. Now, we had mentioned how each daimyo had a very sizable army. You might be wondering, well, where did they get all these, uh, these fighters from, right? And so one important development, uh, you know, that reflects kind of a, a, a really important uh, change militarily from what had existed before. You know, prior to the Warring States period, you did have kind of an elite fighting group of samurais, uh, mostly individuals who were highly trained and who fought on horseback, they are now replaced by a much larger number of peasant foot soldiers, who, by the way, are still called samurai, but this would seem to uh, indicate a kind of uh, diminishing of what that term actually signify, right? So these are foot soldiers. They're not as highly trained. They're not fighting on horseback. Uh, they're considered much more expendable. You now have these massive armies with battles involving tens of thousands of troops. Their principal weapon is the thrusting spear, later complemented by muskets, uh, you know, something that within Japanese culture would have been perceived as much less elegant than the samurai sword. Uh, doesn't require as much training in order to be proficient uh, and really is kind of more, you know, strategically depending on just, you know, the idea of basically overwhelming your enemy uh, with a massive number of soldiers, but what it does mean is that the dominance of aristocratic warriors had ended, right? This had been a major feature of Japanese society prior to the Warring States period. Now, what's really interesting is, uh, you know, when we see this kind of development where regular folk are actually uh, converted into soldiers, very often that uh, ends up resulting in, uh, you know, the peasants or regular folk demanding more political power, more political participation. The justification for maintaining political power in the hands of a limited number of individuals, usually based on the idea that those individuals did the fighting. And that became the basis of their claim to political uh, authority and to being, you know, kind of the political elite within a political hierarchy. Uh, so you might anticipate that uh, that kind of development might happen here, that, that peasants would start demanding more power, more political participation, and so forth. But actually, it's not going to play out that way, as we will shortly find. So eventually, uh, the final unification of Japan is going to happen under a fellow named Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Uh, and Hideyoshi, this is kind of interesting, right? This kind of speaks to the, to the point that uh, you know, peasants might demand more political authority. In this case, one individual who starts out as a lowly foot soldier is eventually going to become the preeminent daimyo uh, in Japan and bring an end to the Warring States period. Uh, but, you know, given his own background, he is going to recognize the danger of having so many armed peasants, right, who, you know, at some point, are, are battle tested. I mean, the, you know, they weren't fully trained the way a samurai would have been in the past, but they certainly know their way around uh, a thrusting spear and later on a musket. And so to deal with the possibility of, you know, some kind of peasant-led uprising, uh, he's going to initiate what's known as the sword hunt, uh, wherein, you know, a, a limited number of individuals are, uh, designated officially as constituting a kind of warrior elite. Uh, 
and their job then will be to ensure that nobody else uh, is armed. Uh, and so eventually, the vast majority of the population will be disarmed, and you end up with about 5% of the population who remain a samurai now able to control the other 95%. Hideyoshi is also going to freeze the existing social classes in place, right? Uh, so wherever you end up after the dust settles with the reunification of Japan uh, following the sword hunt, you're pretty much locked in, not just you, but your descendants. Uh, samurai are prohibited from quitting the service. Peasants are not permitted uh, to abandon their fields. Uh, people are expected to marry within their respective classes. And, you know, so each social grouping or class is going to be effectively frozen in place, uh, but will continue to develop in isolation to some degree of the other social groups, right? Each developing its own unique cultural uh, character. And we should know part of that development is also going to see gradations within each class. Uh, right? So, you know, you can become more or less important, but it has to be within the context of whatever class you're born into. Uh, so what that means, for instance, is, you know, if you're a peasant, you remain a peasant, but uh, you might become a landlord and become very wealthy. Uh, you're still engaged in, in agricultural activities, right? But, but that might actually make you more important than, say, a very low-level samurai. Uh, to some degree, depending on the context, the nature of the interaction, and so forth. Uh, but, you know, you can't go from being a farmer to being a samurai, or vice versa. Now, after Hideyoshi, a fellow named Tokugawa Ayasu is going to seize power. Uh, and uh, pretty much he has to deal with a, a kind of potential civil war. Uh, Hideyoshi's vassals actually break into two opposing camps, and so he's going to head one of them and then eventually defeat the other. And in some ways, you could say he is the true unifier of Japan, right? Because after that, there will be no more uh, divisions or political fragmentations. Things will really stabilize. Uh, and he will also establish his new capital at the city of Edo which eventually will be, uh, become absorbed into or become transformed into Tokyo. So almost immediately, Tokugawa is going to initiate a number of political and social structural changes that kind of define uh, the political hierarchy, the, the nature of political authority, how it works in the center versus further afield. He himself will take the title of Shogun in 1603, and refers to his government as a bakufu, so kind of adopting the political language that had existed be before the period of the Warring States. Uh, and almost immediately as well, he will confiscate the lands of his enemies, uh, those who had fought in the opposing camp, uh, and use that territory to reward those who had fought alongside him or were already his vassals. And in fact, uh, whether you were a vassal, an ally, or an enemy, uh, during this period of civil conflict pretty much ends up defining your place politically uh, within the new structures that he creates, right? So he's going to confiscate altogether 150 daimyos and transfer 229 daimyos from one domain to another, right? So kind of taking territory, taking uh, the authority of the daimyo with respect to that territory, transferring it from one individual to another, uh, or just simply eliminating uh, their status as a daimyo altogether. Uh, and, you know, what happened very often depended on to what degree you had been loyal to him up to this point. Uh, but it definitely does a lot to disrupt whatever were kind of existing power bases within Japan, uh, you know, whatever uh, potential certain daimyos might have had to challenge his authority uh, down the road. You know, a lot of this is heavily disrupted. Um, you know, among other things, by severing the long-standing ties that had existed between uh, specific daimyos and their former village retainers, right? So, uh, to a very large degree, your status within Japan from this point forward is going to depend on your relationship to Tokugawa. So, Tokugawa develops what is often referred to as a four-tier system. 
Uh, so at the center, uh, geographically, or at the top, if we think of it as a kind of pyramidal power structure, was the Tokugawa domain, the loyal house daimyos, uh, but also the fiefs of upper samurai. And the revenue derived of these domains furnished stipends for the other 17,000 Tokugawa retainers, right? Those uh, who made up his entourage and who were closest to him. Next were the domains of uh, what are often referred to as the related daimyos, founded by the second and third sons of early shoguns. The idea that they could provide uh, successors to the Tokugawa line if needed, and they were especially loyal, uh, had been allies and, and devoted followers of Tokugawa during this period of civil strife. Uh, beyond were the outside daimyos, and these were allied vassals of Tokugawa, uh, who basically were aligned with him in the seizing of power. And then those who had fought against him constituted the fourth tier. And they would have been geographically uh, the most distant from the center, right? So in a sense, they are actually defined as enemies in the system who need to be uh, kept at a distance uh, and also carefully watched over. But they did have kind of a position of status within the system. And so it is, uh, in the one sense, kind of a pyramidal uh, structure reflective of political authority with Tokugawa at the top, uh, but it's also defined in some ways geographically. Uh, those who are most loyal are actually geographically closest to the royal domain. Uh, enemies are uh, at the greatest distance within Japan. You can kind of see it uh, as mapped out here. Uh, and it's color-coded. Uh, in part to ensure the loyalty of daimyos, especially those who might not be fully trusted, they developed something called the hostage system. So the wives and children of daimyos actually had to reside at the royal palace in Edo, uh, or they also had their own estates in Edo nearby. Uh, and the daimyo himself was actually uh, expected to spend every second year there. Right, so daimyos maintained thousands of retainers and servants in the palatial Edo compounds, uh, but they also had their you know, estate uh, within their own uh, fief further away from the center. Right? But, you know, so kind of on the one hand, keeping them distant, but then the old adage about you know, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer, i.e. where you can keep an eye on them, uh, kind of a factor within this uh, hostage system. Military houses, by the way, uh, were also subject to a very rigorous ethical code. They were expected to practice frugality, not to engage in drinking parties, wanton revelry, etc., etc. They had to uh, maintain their fighting effectiveness, but also, uh, in a sense, provide an example to the rest of Japan. Now, very famously, Tokugawa is going to pursue a policy of seclusion with respect to outside influences. Uh, so this is going to begin in 1635, pretty much ending Japan's foreign trade. Now, initially, it's pretty much directed at China, right? The idea of, you know, maintaining Japanese culture uh, in a more pure state, uh, preventing from their perspective undue influence coming from China. Uh, related to this, no Japanese could leave Japan and the construction of large ships was forbidden. Uh, there was some trade, but, but it was limited to a small community of Chinese merchants in Nagasaki. So in some ways, kind of resembling the Canton system uh, that we talked about with respect to China, though that had more to do with growing European uh, economic activity in the region. And eventually, Europeans are going to become an issue uh, as well for Japan. During the late 16th century, uh, Japan gets kind of drawn into a circuit of trade dominated by the Portuguese, which basically involves uh, Japanese silver being brought to China, right? So the Portuguese are kind of the middlemen uh, in all of this, and then Chinese silk being brought to Japan, and then the profit from that being used to buy Southeast Asian spices for the European markets, right? So the Portuguese are the ones kind of driving uh, this trade, but the commodities to some extent originating uh, in China and Japan. And of course, we already talked about Japanese silver in connection with the development of currency in China.
Uh, and we also talked about uh, the Jesuits becoming more active in China. They're also going to become more active in Japan uh, as well. So uh, with the Portuguese traders come the Jesuit missionaries. Probably one of the most famous Jesuit missionaries ends up operating in Japan, uh, who later is canonized by the Catholic Church, hence why we might refer to him as St. Francis Xavier. Uh, the Jesuits in Japan initially concentrate on samurai. There's kind of this feeling if you convert them, right, that then eventually uh, much of the rest of Japan would follow suit. Uh, they also, of course, work very hard on winning the favor of, you know, whoever constitutes the ultimate political authority in Japan at the time, starting with Oda Nobunaga. Uh, who actually, you know, he's like, well, you know, your religion has a lot to offer, uh, but at the end he decides that this insistence on monogamy is too big a stumbling block for him. Uh, but he, he indicates, I, I would have converted if not for monogamy. Uh, what's kind of interesting that to some extent Christianity seems to make inroads more for stylistic uh, reasons than, you know, having to do with uh, the, the details of Christian belief, right? So Portuguese and Christian objects, for instance, become very fashionable. Uh, you start to see uh, a lot of Christian symbols appearing on uh, things like lacquer boxes and saddles, but that doesn't necessarily correspond to uh, a commitment uh, on the part of the owner of these objects to this uh, new faith. Uh, having said that, it does enjoy a bit of success initially. Uh, partly because uh, it finds a correspondence with a very popular Buddhist sect related to Amida. Uh, Amida is kind of this cosmic Buddha symbol. So this reflects kind of uh, a more religious uh, kind of take on Buddhism than how it began. Uh, for those of you who maybe took History 115. Uh, you know, so this kind of cosmic Buddha is seen as being somehow equivalent to God. Uh, you know, sometimes the nature of Amida's interaction with, uh, with humankind on earth, seen as corresponding to Jesus operating among mankind. Uh, so initially that becomes kind of a point of entry for Christianity. Uh, but eventually, uh, Jesuit missionaries starting with uh, Scavia are going to promote the idea that Buddha and Amida are actually demons, uh, which, you know, you have to admire their... Uh, you know, integrity, their commitment to their Christian faith, but from a practical point of view, uh, this is really going to have negative consequences. Eventually, you know, this is going to turn people off on Christianity, which is eventually banned. Uh, and then, you know, later on, as Europeans become more active in the region imperially, it becomes associated with that. Um, and so at some point, uh, you know, there had been a number of individuals uh, of Japanese who had converted to Christianity. Uh, but after Christianity falls into disfavor, many of them are forced to recant. Uh, some of them resist, but that uh, resistance is eventually put down in 1637 and 1638, uh, with about 37,000 Christians ending up killed uh, and the remaining Christians going underground. Uh, so, you know, had kind of a, a brief period during which it flourished, but eventually that came to an end. Economically, this policy of seclusion is going to mean, for the most part, cutting off foreign trade. Uh, nonetheless, domestic, uh, domestic trade and the domestic economy will grow during this period. Uh, and the fact that you have kind of a period of sustained peace is going to be a major factor, particularly in the growth of commerce, but also increased agricultural productivity. Uh, and then, you know, there are some kind of changes in government policy that actually prove beneficial. Uh, medieval guilds are abolished and certain monopolistic restrictions are eliminated. Uh, and so that kind of allows traders to, to uh, you know, in a sense, become much more independent in, in how they operate. Uh, you could say uh, th that the economy is functioning a little bit more along what, from our point of view, would be capitalistic lines. Uh, what you do see, but, but we don't want to get too carried away with that uh, analogy, because you do see the formation of a national market network uh, that, that does kind of reflect government involvement in the economy. So what you end up with is uh, 
you know, various uh, what we might call domain economies, regional economies, but then the government becoming involved in terms of, you know, trying to interlink those different domain economies, uh, again, through a national market network. In terms of, uh, you know, who's doing what, we end up with a three-tiered system, right? So the peasantry who produce food make up 87% uh, of the population, uh, and they actually end up paying most of the taxes. Uh, basically, one-third of their produce goes to taxation. Uh, at the other end, we have the military class and political elites who make up about 5% of the population, but who are the main consumers of both food uh, and other kinds of goods and services that are provided by the roughly 8% of the population that make up the townspeople. And in line with this high level of segregation between the different social groups, which uh, remember are frozen in place, you have what's known as three area city planning. Uh, basically, uh, the point of which was to ensure that the different social groups uh, lived uh, in the appropriate places and were to some degree separate from one another, right? And this would be, you know, pretty much the same pattern uh, regardless of what town, right? So you have all these castle towns, uh, you know, some of them bordering on, on being cities that are the centers of regional tax economies. Uh, Edo, of course, is the center of national consumption. Uh, so kind of the place to which, uh, you know, the various goods that are being produced throughout Japan are sent and then redistributed. Uh, but, but for the most part, right, every castle town had the same basic city planning, reflective of social divisions, right? So at the center, you'd have a large park-like area where the castle was located, surrounded by parks and moats for the daimyo and his government. So this is also where uh, government would actually function that would be surrounded by an extensive uh, samurai quarter and then further out you would have a meaner uh, as in less wealthy less elegant less beautiful townspeople quarter and peasants would live in the countryside you know and by the way their their uh, ability to actually enter the town uh, and how they actually interacted with other people there would be highly regulated and within the, this kind of national market network, we should note, in addition to Edo, that one other city had a very special role as a redistribution center, uh, primarily for food products. And that would have been Osaka, sometimes referred to as the Kitchen of Japan. And, you know, there you can see some of the older structures of the city uh, with the more modern skyscrapers uh, rising up in the background. Now, the samurais are actually come to be considered an extremely uh, kind of special, almost a social category within Japanese society, Japanese culture. Uh, and, and there's a very specific code of conduct associated with them, right? I mean, where, you know, they, they are really expected to act in a very honorable way. Uh, and that would include also a very strong sense of loyalty to their master, which would usually be a daimyo. Uh, so a really good story that kind of conveys all of that and which, by the way, I mean, has become globally famous, it's been turned into at least one Hollywood film, would be the 47 Ronin. So a Ronin is actually a term meaning a masterless samurai, right? So, you know, the, the whole point, if you're a samurai, you have a master, a daimyo to whom you're especially loyal uh, and losing your master would have been a very traumatic kind of thing, you know, just this kind of feeling of losing your sense of purpose. So in the story, uh, it kind of starts with the daimyo of these 47 uh, samurai uh, being sentenced to death for slightly wounding a bakufu official. And he is sentenced to death by harikari, uh, which some of you know is a kind of very special form of suicide uh, in Japanese culture. Uh, and, you know, being an honorable individual and given that the sentence is considered just, he dutifully carries out the sentence, leaving his 47 uh, ret uh, retainers or samurai as, uh, samurai as masterless. Uh, so, you know, on the one hand, they do have to respect uh, the law in this regard, right, that the sentence was fair. But on the other hand, they, they feel a duty to avenge uh, their fallen master, which after 21 months, they do by taking the head of the Bakufu official 
who had seen him sentenced to death. Uh, they then immediately surrender to the authorities uh, and are condemned to commit harikari themselves, which they do without hesitation. And that, by the way, speaks to the importance of the law as a basis of the social order in Japan, something that in particular samurai were duty bound uh, to respect. Uh, you know, so they are upheld, these 47 ronin are upheld as examples of proper ethical behavior, right? I mean, first of all, greatly admired as virtuous warriors, warriors are greatly admired for their loyalty to their master, right? Loyalty being a highly valued virtue. Nonetheless, uh, right, the law takes precedence at the end of the day, uh, something even they recognized, and, and this would have reflected very well on them. Right, that they, you know, they did uh, their duty in terms of avenging their master, uh, but then they accepted uh, the, the required punishment for that. Right, uh, the state was above ethics, and their death was, uh, for lack of perhaps a better way of putting it, a bureaucratic necessity. Right, I mean, if they were to not honor, uh, you know, the law, like the process of determining uh, the correct punishment, and so forth they would be setting a bad example for society. Well, eventually stagnation, uh, as often is the case, sets in. Some of this might reflect, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, they're not able to interact economically with the neighbors and so forth. Uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, things remain stable, right? Uh, the Bakufu is, is pretty much secure no outside domain uh, is even going to seek to overthrow it uh, part of that reflects the growth of the bureaucracy uh, which has greatly proliferated uh, the development of new administrative codes which means a lot more paperwork which means a lot more people working the bureaucracy but the bureaucracy in a sense provides a pathway uh, to success but a pathway that doesn't involve challenging the authority of the bakufu in fact it upholds it uh, nonetheless, right, if we talk about stagnation, uh, primarily we're talking about, uh, you know, beginning with economic stagnation, starting with agriculture. Uh, eventually, we're going to see the reinstatement of guilds and monopolies, you know, the kind of growth of the bureaucracy inhibiting economic activity to some degree. Um, uh, so economic stagnation, the fact that the different social classes are kind of frozen in place you know, in a sense can also be stifling in terms of allowing for, you know, kind of positive development or growth. Uh, individuals, you know, among the political elite or samurai class, some of this stagnation might have been seen as uh, being reflected in a new urban culture that tended to be more secular and vulgar, uh, often based more on humor. Uh, you know, this, this did, really did reflect a kind of innovation with respect to earlier Japanese uh, tradition, uh, you know, so the whether we're talking about literary works or, or uh, you know, artistic depictions, woodblock prints became very popular during this period. Uh, one very famous individual in connection with this is Utamaro. You know, so very often the images that might be printed or the kind of stories that were being told, you know, uh, much more lowbrow, you know, just kind of reflecting uh, the the kind of activities and behavior of lower class people, uh, sometimes bordering on the pornographic, uh, you know, and so people at the top would have looked down upon this. This in fact kind of reflects what was a uh, kind of double structure that was developing even culturally, right, where you, you know, during the Tukugawa, uh, Tokugawa shogunate, uh, with respect to urban culture, we see the development of two strands, one reflective of high culture, embraced by the samurai in particular, uh, and one reflective of low culture corresponding, corresponding to the townspeople, right? Uh, you know, so high culture, you know, in a sense, kind of reflected a long-standing tradition that influences coming from China, uh, reflected kind of a uh, you know, a, a, a more high-minded point of view, kind of more educated point of view, uh, very often connected with Confucian influences. And so it was this kind of culture that the samurai embraced. Townspeople, lowbrow, secular, uh, satirical, very often uh, mocking the quote-unquote pretentiousness of of the samurai of political elites, but even making fun uh, of themselves. 
uh, and very often very vulgar, right? Very, you know, kind of base, kind of, shall we say, body, na naughty humor. Uh, on the subject, though, of cultural developments, we should also note that Japan is going to experience a revival of Buddhism, which uh, at this point had been around for quite a quite a while. But you know, particular with particularly with Japan's growing secularization, uh, had kind of fallen a bit to the wayside, but is now going to have a bit of a comeback. Uh, the monk Hakuin is going to play a pretty important role in connection with that. So wrapping things up with a few specific examples of both low and high culture in Tokugawa, Japan. Uh, with respect to the first, a good example would be Ihara Saikaku, who lived between 1642 and 1693, came from a merchant family who, following the death of his wife, basically devoted himself to pleasure. Uh, you make of that what you will. Uh, what that meant in practice was poetry, theater, and frequent visits to the pleasure quarters. Uh, and then kind of in connection with this, at 40, he wrote and illustrated the very successful The Life of an Amor Amorous Man, the story of a modern and body, and I hope we all know what the word body means, uh, say a polite way of saying uh, naughty in a sexual way, uh, of a character named Prince Genji, uh, and this proved very popular. And he also wrote about 20 additional works, but pretty much in the same vein. Uh, so that's, that's a really pretty good example of exactly the kinds of works we're talking about uh, with respect to low culture. With regard to high culture, probably the best example would be Chikamatsu Monsaemo, uh, who lived between 1653, 1742, and in this case, a samurai, uh, right? So this is the kind of literature that would appeal to samurais, but he himself was one, in the service of a court aristocrat who later on moved to Osaka where he wrote for both the kabuki and puppet theater, uh, two genres of theater very popular uh, in Tokugawa, Japan. Uh, in fact, probably some of you have heard of kabuki theater. Uh, at the time that Chik uh, Chikamatsu was writing, it was likely to take one of three uh, forms, either dance, uh, in some ways analogous with ballet in Europe, uh, drama, or hi historical works, right? And he wrote all three. And, you know, the thing about high culture is, you know, it's not about just entertaining, it should edify right? You should learn something from it to become a better person. And so in a lot of these stories, there would be a protagonist who uh, ultimately was undone uh, by his or her uncontrollable passions, and the story would end in tragedy, right? And again, you know, the idea in this case, you should learn how to control your passions and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, here's what can happen when you don't do that. This is, you know, if you think about it, quite the opposite of the example of lowbrow literature that we looked at where, you know, almost celebrating uh, this kind of devotion to one's passions, to one's pleasure. And we might finish with a, uh, a brief discussion of Tokugawa theater. Uh, you know, again, Kabuki, uh, probably the most famous uh, outside of Japan. Uh, very much uh, about dramatic realism, you know, so it's like very realistic. Uh, characters that the audience can empathize with, in some ways very similar to Elizabethan drama, i.e. from the, you know, English drama from the time of Queen Elizabeth, probably the best example of which would be Shakespeare. Uh, in the early 18th century, uh, Kabuki kind of fell to the wayside a bit and was displaced by puppet theater. And, you know, I think probably you find puppet theater in most cultures. Uh, maybe for Americans, most famous would be French puppet theater, you know, kind of little hand puppets hitting each other. Uh, in this case, the puppets were quite sophisticated, right? About half the size of the human, uh, human beings who would have been uh, manipulating them, right? And, and really, they're very sophisticated in the sense that you could really mimic even subtle movements, in some cases, even facial expressions and so forth. Uh, so in any event, right, uh, this is uh, where we end our discussion of developments in Asia. Uh, such as correspond to chapter 18. And uh, mostly we focus on developments in China and Japan. Of course, we could be talking about, uh, you know, developments in other parts of Asia, particularly Southeast Asia. Uh, 
uh, some of which would have been very similar, most of which uh, definitely reflected Chinese influence. Uh, but shall we say, uh, with a survey course of this kind, uh, you know, one of the unfortunate things is you always have to make choices about what to cover uh, and what to leave, uh, leave behind. Uh, so uh, do remember to answer the questions related to this lecture uh, and see you with the uh, lecture corresponding to chapter 19.